presenters. And uh, unfortunately, Cheryl um, could not make it. She's in urgent care getting uh, sprained or broken or had some injury to her ankle and uh, I won't be able to make it. So I'm trying to fill in as best I can. Uh, and this is the first time I've ever operated one of these. So hopefully you can hear me. Is there any way that folks could uh, maybe uh, give me an affirmative in the chat boxes or something like that? So uh, we know you can hear us. The question, questions are coming in. They say they do hear you. Great. OK, and that includes the room, I assume. Yes, all right. OK, so uh, I think we're going to get started. Uh, the subject today is ASHRAE Standard 209P, the uh, Energy Simulation Aided Design for Buildings. Uh, a couple of us are going to give you an overview of this uh, standard that's out for public re review right now. And then uh, we're going to open it up for questions. So let me turn it over to my mentor, Jason Glazer, and he's going to introduce himself. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is Jason Glazer um, with Guard Analytics. Uh, probably a lot of you know me from um, running the uh, uh, mailing list for Building Sim and eQuest users and such. Um, and I'm also uh, part of the Energy Plus development team. Um, here I'm uh, actually serving the role of the chair of uh, Standard 209, and uh, Marcus is uh, uh, one of the members of that committee also. And we'd like to uh, Welcome, everyone, to the presentation. So once again, this is Marcus. I'm with Seven Group. Uh, we do consulting work primarily on green building projects and are uh, doing a lot of work nowadays in uh, regenerative design and, and some of those kinds of aspects. Um, we wrote a book a number of years ago on the integrative design process in which kind of uh, the energy modeling uh, process was mapped out in the context of that integrative process. Uh, I've done a lot of work over the years with the U.S. Green Building Council and LEED, uh, and I also answer energy modeling questions on LEED user. So um, happy to be here. So I think we're going to launch right into the presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the uh, questions box and uh, we'll try and get to them as, as time allows. All right, um, just to give you a little background on the process that ASHRAE uses, um, the different standards uh, like 90.1, 62.1, 189.1, uh, they, they all go through uh, public review, usually in little pieces, but uh, when a new standard comes along, um, like standard 209, um, the whole document goes out for public review and, and can be downloaded from uh, ASHRAE's website um, and it's announced in a document called Standards Action which comes out just about every week. So, so um, 209 is titled Energy Simulation Aided Design for Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential Buildings and as I said it's going through public review right now. It came out um, March 25th for a public review and is closing just in a little while on uh, May 9th. So the website there on the screen um, is where you can both download the document, take a look at it, as well as provide comments to us about the uh, document. So the purpose and scope are um, shown there on the screen. The, the scope basically is the same scope as you might see with 90.1 and, and is actually very similar to 189.1 also. Um, and 62.1 is a little different but similar to it. But basically it applies to commercial buildings and um, also high-rise residential buildings. Uh, the purpose though for this standard is very different. Uh, it's all about providing assistance using energy simulation. So uh, that is clearly shown as the purpose, and, and hopefully um, uh, that's clear to everyone. What's uh, important to understand
understand about this document is that it's not intended to be required for all buildings. Um, it really is um, following that purpose line. It's, utilize, it's for utilizing energy simulation during the design process. So when a um, organization that uh, references 209 requires it, then modeling would be required for a project that complies with that, that organization. If a utility or a government agency were to uh, adopt it, uh, then it would be required in those circumstances. But we're expecting that most of the time uh, it's going to be required by beyond code kinds of programs. Um, building owners also might use this standard um, as a way of basically finding a scope of work. So it, it's a way that hopefully um, a building owner or architect that doesn't really know a lot about simulation but knows that they want to include um, analysis as part of their design process can simply reference a document and know uh, uh, roughly what kind of deliverables they're going to be getting for that. So just giving you a brief history, um, I wanted to give you a flavor of, of um, the fact that this standard has basically been driven by the building simulation community. It started as a discussion on the building sim mailing list uh, many years ago. Um, the community actually helped draft the title, purpose, and scope that was uh, ultimately endorsed by a bunch of uh, ASHRAE committees um, many years ago, it seems. And then um, <laughs> our first meeting was in June of 2012. So we're coming up on four year, our fourth year of anniversary here. Um, we have a large committee compared to a lot of, of um, ASHRAE committees that are just starting out. Uh, most are, are usually uh, a dozen people or less, but we have actually 51 people on our roster with 26 full committee voting members. And that's because there was a lot of interest from the uh, building energy modeling community to be involved in this process from the very beginning. So I think that uh, part of the strength of the process so far has been that we've had a lot of involvement from a lot of uh, very knowledgeable people. So you can kind of see, I think, why it took so long. Try to get 51 energy modelers to agree on anything. So, so um, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, <laughs> so why do we need this standard? Well, I, I uh, try to explain it to people that um, Appendix G, while it kind of uh, prompted the use of building energy modeling uh, in a more widespread way uh, through LEED and through uh, tax incentives and such, um, that that modeling all takes place usually at the end of the design process uh, when decisions have all been made. Um, and the reason for building simulation in general really is to inform the design process from the start. And so we're trying to uh, move a standard along that can be adopted and maybe encourage more use of um, modeling at the beginning of the process and throughout the process so that decisions are made based on uh, information from the, from the models that are developed uh, throughout the process. So many of you, I'm sure, have seen this graphic as the design process moves forward, the impact that you can have by making informed design decisions kind of declines over time, uh, while and the level of effort required to implement those kinds of changes increases uh, over time. So uh, the typical energy modeling time frame tends to be a little later in the process, if not, as Jason said, occurring at the very end. Uh, in that instance, it's really just, it's not adding any value to the process when you do an energy model at the very end, say, to figure out how many lead points you're going to get. The real value of energy modeling is guiding and helping make informed design decisions throughout the development of the design, and the standard is explicitly designed to try and address that particular issue. So some of the things that have been going on in the industry have uh, provided some impetus for this. Uh, there's an integrative process uh, ANSI standard uh, that was developed a few years ago. Um, basically the uh, book that, that uh, Seven Group participated in writing uh, is uh, kind of the reference guide for that integrative process. 
Um, so that standard, that ANSI standard has been out for a little while. And LEED has slowly begun to try and incorporate uh, some of this integrative process into the development of LEED, especially the most current version of LEED, LEED v4. Uh, you'll see that that says 2013, I guess that's when it first came out. Uh, a little later this year, it's going to be required of all projects as LEED 2009 kind of goes away. Um, in LEED v4, there's an integrative process credit, and then there's also some requirements that you have to meet on in terms of design phase modeling in order to earn any of the optimized energy credit points. So the IP credit basically requires you uh, before the end of schematic designs to do some simple box modeling to uh, try and conduct some analysis that's going to be used to inform the development of the design. So the nature of that analysis may vary somewhat depending upon the nature of the project. Uh, in the case of brand new construction you may be analyzing architectural massing ideas. Uh, in the case of an existing building maybe you're looking at uh, some other parameters that would impact the energy use. The point here is to do some of that really early simple box modeling to help you start to explore the energy loads in the building and how you're going to go about addressing them. Following that early stage modeling, um, there is design phase modeling required in the optimized energy performance credit. You need to do two additional uh, modeling cycles and uh, the standard kind of addresses this concept of modeling cycles so we'll get into that later. But you have to do basically two rounds of modeling or two modeling cycles uh, in the development of your design. Ahead of those two modeling cycles you need to establish an EUI energy target for the project early in the process. So if you earn the LEED IP credit and you want to earn optimized energy performance credits in LEED v4, you need to establish an energy target. You need to do, if you're going to earn all that, you need to do basically three rounds of design phase energy modeling to inform decision making. So a little bit about the uh, layout of the uh, draft standard. Um, much like a lot of ASHRAE standards, it starts with uh, purpose and scope sections followed by definitions. Um, and there we, after that, we've taken a, a little different approach. Um, there's a uh, section four is basically the rules for how do you comply with the document. Um, and then there's a general requirement section and then a big section on the design phase models and then the construction and operation uh, modeling cycles. So the uh, general requirements section has um, a lot of uh, general requirements um, about the software, uh, modeling credential requirements. It also requires you to, to perform some analysis on the uh, climate and site and do some benchmarking. Uh, these are things that we, re we feel are um, a good idea no matter when uh, modeling is applied uh, during the process. Uh, there's also a requirement for an energy charrette, um, establishing uh, performance goals, which ties right into uh, LEED v4. And then there's also uh, some general modeling cycle requirements because we found when we went through all the modeling cycles that there was actually a lot of, there was more similarity between the cycles than uh, differences. So we lumped those into a um, section just on general modeling cycle requirements. Um, the seven modeling cycles there uh, are for the design phase, and you can see they stretch all the way from something you do right at the beginning, like simple box modeling, all the way to value engineering. And then the um, construction and operation modeling cycles are shown there. Uh, basically, these are things that you'd be doing um, much later in the process. So what does minimum requirements for um, this new standard? Uh, basically, you need to comply with Section 5, so all those requirements that are in Section 5. Plus, you need to do the load uh, reduction modeling cycle. Um, and then you get 
your, cho your choice of any of the other design phase modeling cycles. So to minimally comply with the standard, that's all you've got to do. Now, what we're expecting is that some um, adopting authorities um, will want to do more than that. So they can either specify specific modeling cycles or specify a certain number of modeling cycles or require uh, modeling cycles that are for after the design process. So that's up to the, the adopting authority, but we've kind of left, um, left it flexible for them to uh, choose other options to, for ways of complying. But one thing that's good about this is that in general, there is this uh, underlying requirement to um, do at least load reduction modeling which we feel is one of the most uh, important types of modeling throughout the design process. And as you can see, the minimum compliance requirements kind of align with the LEED V4 requirements. So a couple of the general requirements uh, in just a little bit more detail. Um, these are part of the general requirements. These are things that uh, the folks on the committee felt strongly that basically every project ought to engage in, at least at, at a, uh, a basic level. So you need to take a look at the local climate and uh, what's going on on the site where the project is going to be built. So taking a look at local climactic data, trying to uh, figure out and estimate how that uh, that particular climate might influence the development of the design, as well as looking at what's going on on your particular site. Is there a 25-story building next door? Is there a hill right behind there? Um, is there some sort of maybe microclimate issue going on on the site? Um, what are the characteristics of the site that may influence the building's ultimate energy use? So in addition to evaluating the climate and the site characteristics, then you need to create a list of climate and site-specific design strategies that would be utilized to um, uh, be applied uh, to some of your early phase modeling. Um, so it's, I think, important to keep in mind here that we're not asking you to keep doing this over and over again for uh, the same general climate. Uh, zone. So a lot of this, once you do it once, then you've pretty much got it down and then you'd be assessing site characteristics each time for that climate zone, climate area I should say. The second general requirement here is to conduct uh, benchmarking. So this is the process you go through to uh, gather data in order to develop an informed performance goal for the project's uh, energy use. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, the data that's out there, the CBIX data, Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey data uh, that the Department of Energy does every few years. Um, and thank goodness we're actually getting, I believe it's 2012 data now instead of 2003 data. Uh, that's just starting to come out. Um, many of you are familiar with using Target Finder to help establish some sort of EUI target for your project. Uh, and then there's other um, tools that you can use like the 2030 challenge or um, different performance databases. There's all of the data that's coming out of the building benchmarking that's going on in various municipalities all across the country, like New York City and so forth. So there's more and more data out there, and basically the idea behind benchmarking is to utilize that data to create an informed uh, project performance goal for your particular project. As part of that process, another general requirement is you need to conduct an energy charrette or an energy meeting. Uh, essentially, you need to gather the design team together and talk about the purpose of energy modeling on the project, what you are planning to do, what you're thinking about doing. Uh, part of this meeting should include a discussion of the performance metrics and goals that you're going to be applying to this particular project. Um, if there's previous modeling that's been done on other projects that, can, that might be similar, that might inform the development of this design, that information could be shared. Uh, what are the financial criteria uh, that we're going to use for decision making? 
um, so on and so forth. So the idea is to have a general discussion with the overall project team so that everybody's clear about what the energy targets are going to be uh, and if you don't develop them at the meeting, how are they going to be developed? Uh, and so everybody's very clear on what modeling we're planning to do and uh, to what end are, are we uh, trying to use that model, that modeling to help inform design decisions. And then once you've established this overall performance goal, the standard also requires you to examine and then establish performance goals at a system level. So the overall energy goal doesn't have to be an EUI, uh, energy utilization index. It could be some other metric that you decide. Maybe it's carbon-based, maybe it's dollar-based, maybe it's some other metric that would make sense. Uh, but the standard also requires you to not only establish that overall goal, and the problem that we found with a lot of projects is nobody owns that overall goal since it's a collective goal. So it's important to establish project performance goals for various systems uh, around the building envelope, uh, lighting, for example, what's the watts per square foot of lighting we're targeting, uh, what's the watts per square foot of plug loads we're looking at, uh, what are our HVAC system uh, performance goals, maybe it's square foot a ton or some other metric associated with fan power or, right, you get the idea, you're breaking down the individual building systems and performance goals up front for those various uh, building systems. And that information, all of that information needs to be incorporated into the project's uh, OPR. So we, we've thrown out the word modeling cycle a lot, and um, it probably is really not that different than um, what you do on a regular basis. Um, essentially, it's to uh, update your, your baseline and goal information, um, gather the information that you need to do your modeling with, um, probably do some QA throughout the process, um, actually conduct the analysis with your simulation program of choice, um, put together some reports to your customer, and then probably do a little bit more QA at the end. And um, this concept of a modeling cycle um, is probably not that different than, as I said, what uh, you regularly do. But we've kind of um, tried to lay it out in a standard way so that the terminology that's used is something that uh, the whole industry could benefit from sharing. and. Um, Perhaps that's a way to um, <clears throat> further the industry's way of communicating about things and, and um, understanding uh, the nuances of the different parts of each modeling cycle. And then the, um, the, the seven design phase modeling cycles are shown here again. Um, you can see that they're um, associated with different parts of the design process, different steps in the design process. And that's because actually at one point we um, assumed that the document was going to be laid out. Uh, there was going to be a conceptual design section, schematic design section, et cetera. But after we uh, looked at all these modeling cycles, we realized that there was really a lot of commonality behind it all. And we uh, put the general requirements, we put this section on a generic modeling cycle, and then we condensed the modeling cycles to be just standalone sections so that they're not subsections of something else. Um, although in general we would expect that um, load reduction modeling, for example, would happen during schematic design, uh, et cetera. So let's talk about each one in turn. I think there is some guidance, if I remember, Jason, for each modeling cycle in terms of approximately when in the process they should be completed by. I know there's some general guidance in that regard, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, there's some general guidance and, and it talks about uh, a few of the modeling cycles should be completed after other modeling cycles, for example, um, or during certain phases of the project. So as a reminder, right, you're, you are required to implement modeling cycle number three and then all the rest are optional. Obviously, um, you know, I guess one way you could 
maybe a little cynically look at the standard as well. Maybe I'll just pick an easy one and do that one. Um, I'd suggest that in order to truly embrace the idea behind the standard, um, the second one that you pick, if you're doing the minimum number, um, should be the one that adds the most value to the project. Uh, and that's not always going to be the same depending upon uh, each individual, pro individual project's needs. Um, so the first modeling cycle we identified in the process that would provide some uh, useful information and guidance would be to create a simple box model. Typically this would be done um, most of the time for say a new construction project uh, before you start to develop the building's design itself. So obviously you can see depending upon when the modeler would get involved with the project, some of these modeling cycles may actually not be available to you anymore, say if they're getting involved later. But the idea behind this one is to start to do some rudimentary modeling uh, very early on. Uh, quite often a simple box model is used to help guide discussion during the energy charrette. Um, so it can be done that early. Uh, it can be done to help quickly and easily try and analyze different energy efficiency strategies. Typically when you're looking at a, a simple box model, you're uh, creating a, a model that's similar to the building that you're going to create, but it's not going to look like the building you're creating. It, it has the, about the same amount of area, it's in the same location, it's the same number of floors, um, but it's, as the name implies, a much simpler box. So. You can utilize this to look at building geometry issues and window to wall ratio issues, things like orientation. So quite often a simple box model is used to help then inform the development of the architect's conceptual designs. So in many ways this would be in alignment with the IP credit in LEED, the integrative process credit in LEED uh, that's being used to help inform the development of the design. Another important piece of information that you can quite often get out of a simple box model is what's the, what's the kind of energy use by end use distribution of the energy uh, going to be on this particular project. So for example, if you do a simple box model and the model shows that less than 1% of my energy use is going to be for service hot water, then you probably don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out how to reduce your service hot water energy use. And conversely, if 45% of your energy use is going to be for heating, uh, you might want to spend a lot of time on that. So uh, this particular model uh, can be used to create and uh, evaluate different strategies at a very, very early stage of the design. The second modeling cycle would be um, kind of the next iteration of your simple box model. Typically, again, in new construction projects, um, this particular modeling cycle would be explicitly used, uh, for example, to evaluate different conceptual designs. So by way of example, let's say the architect has developed uh, three general design ideas that have somewhat different massing, configuration, right, the look and feel of the building in all three cases is somewhat different. So you can use this particular modeling cycle to evaluate uh, different conceptual designs. You could also use this particular modeling cycle to evaluate different ideas within the context of a single conceptual design. So the idea here is primarily to inform uh, the, the re set up the reduction in loads, but to inform the development of the architecture for most projects. And you'll see a note there, the very first bullet point, that if you have a really high process load building like a manufacturing facility or a data center, then this particular cycle does not apply. So modeling cycle three, this is the one that is required of all projects. And the whole idea here is to develop the project in a way that reduces the building's heating and cooling loads for most projects, right? Again, high process load buildings, your loads are going to be different, but for most uh, um, commercial buildings, the uh, loads are going to be uh, heating and cooling loads that you're looking to reduce. So Again, that's informed by the architecture, 
of the building, the massing, the orientation, uh, the window to wall ratios, uh, what opportunities do we have to uh, provide daylighting so we don't have to provide artificial lighting, um, looking at even internal loads, uh, lighting power densities, and obviously daylighting ties into that, but even looking at uh, plug loads and other internal loads, how can we reduce those? So quite often this load reduction modeling is done uh, early in the development of the design, typically in schematic design, and it's often done in combination with the development of the project's heating and cooling loads. So once you have a really good idea of what the heating and cooling loads are being driven by, then you, you can focus your attention on the larger aspects of the load to try and figure out how to minimize those loads. And the whole idea behind this is to have an impact on the development and sizing of the HVAC system. So the classic example here is if I can make the building more energy efficient with, say, more insulation and better windows and good daylighting and low lighting power densities, then I can reduce the size of the HVAC system. Um, and in some cases, it's actually possible to reduce the cost of the HVAC system enough to pay for all the energy efficiency strategies that were incorporated into the project uh, to reduce the loads in the first place. So there's a requirement here that you do need to complete this particular modeling phase by the end of schematic design and then to uh, further utilize any subsequent modeling, uh, develop that list of load reductions uh, strategies and then evaluate their effect on performance. So all of these modeling cycles, um, it would not say be sufficient to say create a model and run one iteration on insulation alone, for example. The idea is to examine the interactive effects of a series of energy efficiency strategies that you want to evaluate relative to the project. So a modeling cycle should typically embody a number of different individual uh, modeling iterations. And then modeling cycle number four, uh, again, this probably takes place towards the end of schematic design, maybe early DD would probably be acceptable, um, is to uh, utilize the model to help evaluate your selection of an HVAC system. So up to this point, um, you certainly could use some of those earlier modeling cycles to start to evaluate HVAC system options, but this particular cycle is explicit about it. So um, the idea, I think, here being once you've gone through the load reduction modeling cycle that preceded this, um, it's always a good idea to do that cycle ahead of your HVAC system selection modeling cycle. Um, what we found in our experience is quite often if you do the analysis at standard loads, and, and the analysis I mean here is uh, evaluating different HVAC system choices, say you're evaluating three different systems. Um, quite often when you do a life cycle costing analysis for those three systems, you may get a very different result if you do that analysis at conventional loads or if you do that analysis based on the loads having been significantly reduced. Uh, we've seen it happen time and time again that you end up picking the, a different HVAC system in that analysis if you evaluate the loads first and then the HVAC system selection later. So you can see the requirement here is it must take place after load reduction modeling and then you have to compare at least two HVAC uh, alternative systems. And Jason's picking it up from here. Yeah, um, let's see. Modeling cycle number five is all about design refinement, and uh, it's definitely taking place during DD. Um, we require specifically that the building form and orientation has been figured out, that the HVAC system has been selected, um, and that there's been a space programming scheme already figured out. So basically this is all about uh, focusing on specific categories of uh, energy efficiency measures and trying to figure out um, what the best selection is for that particular uh, area. So we say that you can focus on one or more of the following categories. Um, so this would be perhaps something that you would be focusing, let's say, on a daylighting measure and looking at 
uh, trade-offs between window placement and and the impact on HVAC systems and such. So um, it is a, a refinement task, and and uh, a lot of design decisions are actually made uh, during we expect will be made based on this uh, design refinement uh, modeling cycle. The ne next uh, modeling cycle is all about uh, having uh, optimization um, of various parameters at once. So if you uh, want to optimize a design decision where you're looking at a lot of different variables with different constraints and you're running a, uh, a large suite of simulations to try to um, reach those optimization objectives, then this cycle might be appropriate for it. Uh, you can basically apply it to all sorts of building systems at once and find the, uh, maybe not find the local minimum for your design options, but it definitely helps identify a, uh, a good choice uh, using optimization. And then uh, value engineering, this one is uh, specifically aimed at times when um, we're expecting the first cost of the building to be trying to be reduced and probably the energy consumption of the building uh, being increased. So essentially the value of this um, modeling cycle is all about saying how, how bad is that change going to be to the energy consumption of the building and trying to make sure that people who are making those decisions are informed about all the repercussions of those decisions and not simply that it's saving them money up front. So this uh, modeling cycle is basically uh, probably one that a lot of people uh, wish they were involved with during the design process where decisions are made to, to make something um, significantly worse than the original design uh, as far as energy performance and uh, this modeling cycle will provide the opportunity to um, give that feedback to the building owner and architect. I think this is back to you, Marcus. Yep. So the, uh, the remaining modeling cycles are basically outside the requirements of the standard uh, per se, but um, we, we have these in. These are commonly, uh, we felt, you know, uh, pretty commonly performed uh, modeling cycles. Uh, or modeling cycles that uh, could certainly continue to add value to the project. Um, so some of these are the, the kind of modeling cycles that many people are very familiar with already. Uh, for example, the as design performance modeling cycle uh, would be commonly done, say, for a lead project. Uh, it's typically done based on the final design documents and you're making a, a number of assumptions at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, it's based on the, the building as it's currently uh, designed at that particular point. The next modeling cycle that we identified is um, similar to value engineering. If you reach a point in a project where you may want to evaluate, say, uh, different alternatives, uh, alternates in terms of what's been accepted or not accepted into the design, um, uh, or uh, particular change orders during construction. Anything that may change from the original design document uh, that would impact energy use, you can utilize the model to evaluate those kind of uh, change orders or alternates uh, in the project, um, similar to the uh, value engineering cycle. So those two are typically done during construction. And then following construction, we have an as-built energy performance modeling cycle. So for example, in, uh, for lead projects, um, I think many people know this, but some probably don't, uh, you are still actually required to do a final as-built uh, building model for lead. Um, even if you did your model based on the design, if anything changed during construction, you're required to update the model to uh, make those changes that happen during construction when you kind of check off uh, the design credits and move on to the construction credits, you basically are checking off saying nothing's changed during construction that's going to impact this credit. So if you check that and something did change, you know, you're supposed to be doing that final as-built uh, model. 
but this is basically based on the building as it was built, not necessarily as it was designed. And then the final, mo final modeling cycle we have in the standard is one where you go through the exercise of comparing the energy modeling results that you've produced to the actual building's energy performance. So doing a comparative analysis of the modeling results and the actual building, um, not at the level of calibrated simulation that you might do for a measurement and verification effort, but it's basically doing a simple comparison. Uh, the whole idea here is what can I learn from uh, my modeling results and comparing them to the actual building. How far was I off? Why was I off that far? Um, what aspect of the building didn't perform uh, as I may have predicted it would or, or wouldn't? And what are the explanations for that? So without going into the full-blown calibrated simulation, there's a lot of useful comparisons that you can do, um, calculating error metrics and doing things like an energy signature on the building, so mapping your results against weather data. Uh, there's a number of different things you can do to run a comparative analysis between your model result and the actual to learn something um, from that process. So, um, you know, for example, almost every project that we do the energy model for, we follow up to see how the building actually performed because we want to know how well did we model it. Uh, and this process would uh, kind of uh, quick and easy, this shouldn't take a whole lot of time to do, uh, would be a, a process you could use to do that uh, kind of evaluation. Yeah, and, and uh, we don't have any slides on these other portions, but uh, there are actually um, about eight pages, I think, of uh, informative appendices. Uh, one's on climate information, one's on benchmarking, another on um, there's a informative appendix on the owner project requirements from kind of a simulation perspective um, and then some uh, some references so uh, that informative information hopefully will also help uh, with people trying to comply with the standard um, but I guess I'd like to reiterate that we really need uh, the help of um, the industry I mean this I, we hope this is going to be an important document that uh, is useful to the industry and and we really would like um, constructive comments from everyone. Uh, so please, uh, please download it, take a look through it. Um, the deadline is May 9th. Um, I guess think about the fact when you when you are reviewing it that it is a standard. Uh, so it is defining requirements uh, that everyone has to live with, not just for a particular project. So keep in mind the the trade-offs of that 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 requires. Um, the whole document is uh, less than 30 pages long, so it's not it's not going to be a, a huge amount of reading for you. And I would encourage everyone to uh, take a look and uh, provide comments. So hey, uh, Jason and Marcus, this is Eric Colder up here. Uh, there is a, an online question. Would you like to take that now? Sure, we'd be happy to open it up for questions if anybody has any. Um, so there's this question from uh, Ramya Shiv Kumar, and uh, it is, what do you expect the impact of the standard to be on the cost of energy modeling services? The current fee structure does not support intensive modeling for all projects. Well, that's a real easy question to answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the current well, let me let me maybe try and go backwards and I'll let you have a shot Jason I, I think the the current fee structure um, is all predicated on a particular scope of work uh, typically what I see for many projects and I'll speak to maybe projects uh, going after lead certification it seems to be a big chunk of of uh, the market when it comes to doing energy models that would be in alignment with the standard for new construction projects. So the, the current fee structure, right, is predicated on the scope, the minimum scope of work that you would do for LEED, uh, which quite often is to do an energy model at the very end of the process and then figure out how many LEED points you're going to get based on that. Um, it's my personal opinion, 
not going to speak for the committee here, that that really actually doesn't add any value to the project at all. Um, it, it adds, in many cases, really only cost. And I think the idea behind this particular standard, the idea behind what LEED is trying to do in the new versions of LEED, is to actually turn energy modeling into a value-adding process in the development of the design. So obviously owners need to understand um, that value proposition and understand kind of, and it's incumbent upon modelers, I think, to be able to uh, share with owners uh, what value they can add by doing this design phase modeling. So doing the, you know, for example, a lot of utility incentive programs require you to do design phase modeling. So tap into those and add value. Quite often those utility incentives will more than pay for any extra modeling costs associated with it. Sometimes the utility program will actually pay you to do that. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities in design, I think, to try and address the, uh, the whole impact of fees. Um, the important thing, I think, is by all means, don't do any design phase modeling unless it's going to add value to the project, unless it's going to um, basically be able to recoup uh, e at the very least an energy savings in a short period of time uh, if you can recoup those fees. Quite often what we found though is you can find some incentives, you can find some first cost reductions through this process. Uh, there are a number of things that you can do in order to try and address that fee structure. Okay, so... Um... And, and I guess I'd like to add um, that, you know, the amount of effort um, that's required by the standard was something that was debated extensively in the committee, and that's how we ended up with this um, requiring one design, um, the load reduction modeling cycle and one other modeling cycle, I, I think was a, a way of saying, well, let's get some modeling in the process, but uh, we can't expect people to um, model every single step of the process. Okay. I think that's a really good point, Jason. I mean, I know I've done every one of those modeling cycles, but I've never done any one of those modeling cycles on one project. Certainly all of it is a lot. Okay. Well, we do have a few more questions. Um, Eric here again. Uh, first was uh, just regarding will this webinar be available for later viewing? Uh, it is being recorded, so hopefully if all goes right, it will be available later when there will be an announcement on that. Uh, then Jim Dirks asks, what is driving the market to do more early design modeling? How do you think the value of early design modeling can be encouraged? And maybe that's a little bit, maybe you partially answered that already, but do you have any other thoughts on that? Well, in terms of what's driving the market, um, you know, I think we, and I'm not sure Jim caught the beginning of the presentation, we did talk a little bit about that. Lead V4 is certainly going to be driving the market. You know, I think there's still tax incentives and utility rebates and things along those lines that seem to be the, the primary market drivers. What, what am I missing, guys? No, I, I think that's a pretty good summary. I, I mean, hopefully the... Um, existence of the standard will actually encourage um, more organizations perhaps to um, adopt the standard and, and thus prompt a little bit more uh, modeling early in the design process. So, Okay. Um, so another question from Daniel Liu. So it says, my current impression is that MEP engineers do not often trust energy modeling results. Uh, so by requiring cycle three load reduction, do you expect MEP engineers will more often use energy model results for HVAC sizing? So I, I, my initial response to the second part would be uh, don't do that. Um, generally, energy models don't look at sizing exactly the same way as sizing software does. So. Um, I guess there's some models that do sizing and modeling, but so I, I'd, I'd be careful about that. Um, depending upon the modeling software you use, 
quite often what we see is you're kind of running the, the sizing software and the modeling software concurrently. Because, um, yeah, I think a lot of uh, design engineers that are going to uh, basically say that's the size of the equipment are going to want to use what they're familiar with and what they trust to do that sizing rather than the energy model if it's something different. And I guess this is Eric here. I would I would maybe add to that that you know the the title load reduction is certainly looking at sort of peak cooling and heating loads to some degree, but it's it's more the idea that you should investigate measures to reduce loads before you think about systems to deal with those loads, and and so. Um, Obviously, the, the energy modeling results can be used to evaluate the feasibility of those measures. Um, you would still need to do your HVC load calcs. So and the, my only other reaction, I guess, is to the first part of the question um, about engineers not trusting energy modeling. Um, I, I've had somewhat the opposite. Um, experience. Um, one of the things that we do is, uh, I, I hate to admit this, I guess, in public, but um, we're one of those firms that does uh, lead reviews, so we've written a bunch of those nasty comments that many of you have received. Um, quite often it appears to us, from that perspective, that a lot of folks put, I think, too much trust in their energy modeling results and don't spend enough time evaluating those results against what might be, you know, good, solid uh, things that you would expect in reality. Um, so quite often we see, I think, that they maybe trust them a little too much. Um, you know, the software said this, therefore uh, I accept that. Um, when you really need to be evaluating those results for reasonableness right. is, is one of the things that we see a lot of folks not necessarily spending a lot of time on. And Daniel had a follow-up comment on this one. Um, he says, but you were hoping that cycle three would reduce capital costs to help pay for other ECMs. And if the MEP engineer doesn't pay attention to that, then you won't, that won't happen. You won't gain that, that benefit. Very true. So something we all need to work on as an industry. Um, now there's an, an, another question. I guess just to, before I go into the other online questions, are there questions in the room? Or um, I guess, uh, Daniel, you're there in the room. Are you writing them down? Is that the idea here? Or do you guys want to um, unmute yourselves and present? Okay, so well, Daniel's writing them down. Anyway, so I'll continue. Um, there's a, a long question here. I'm not sure if I'm able to read it all um, from Moshtaba. So the idea of simple box modeling is good. However, there are two very important problems that should be targeted right from the start using integrated tools and methods. One, optimizing the form and orientation of a single building towards improving energy performance. So that building does not necessarily improve the conditions in urban fabric. You know, for instance, in several cases, south-oriented volumes would create intense shading in winter, et cetera. And two, it is strongly recommended to provide and consider the right choices of shading devices for different surface orientations as early as possible. It is better, therefore, to rethink naming of this high-impact section, section from box modeling to for example, schematic design modeling or schematic modeling. Some chapters from your book, this could be offered for further review uh, from this book. So he, then there's a link that he provides to a, a book. So, um, I mean, the one thing I get out of that is uh, he's su potentially suggesting um, uh, maybe changing the name of that from box modeling to schematic modeling. And I, I, I don't know if, I, I think I I know where box modeling came from. If I remember, it was uh, kind of part of ASHRAE standard 90.11989. If I remember yep. correctly, you, uh, I think that's right. you actually created a box model uh, that was of similar size to your building but wasn't the same configuration. And then you compared that to the building that, that you designed. So that terminology, I think, has been around for a long time, and maybe there is a better word to use, but 
that was kind of the origin of it and you know I think in many ways it's still if you understand the history of it then you understand where it came from and I think also I, um, oh sorry Jason did you have a comment I, I was just going to say that uh, that kind of specific uh, input is something that uh, makes a lot of sense as a, a comment to provide um, so you know please make sure you download the document and and uh, think about posting a comment to, to that regard yeah and Eric here I would I would add that you know there is the the modeling cycle that follows box modeling is conceptual design modeling which which may be um, is the exercise is more like the exercise that you're thinking about and box modeling would obviously not be required it's uh, it's just an optional cycle for anybody Um, okay, so we've got some more comments or questions. Um, so, so Derek says, in many slash all cases, the project is behind. <laughs> well, not my projects. Um, and all parties are rushing to the next deadline or working on another hotter project. As such, the information to make any kind of useful model isn't available, and making assumptions of code minimums really isn't useful, applicable to all jobs. What methods has the committee heard or discussed to confront this business as usual inertia? I've been going first, Jason. You want to go first? <laughs> um, well, I guess I would say that, you know, while we don't explicitly require it be um, part of a integrated design process, it, it is um, well tailored to that kind of process and uh, hopefully um, it will encourage I mean I think that the fact that modeling is required will encourage people to think about the um, assumptions required for modeling and what the owner's project requirements are and uh, all those kind of big decisions that need to be made and how they impact things hopefully those thoughts will happen earlier in the process so um, maybe the standard will actually encourage uh, better timing of those kinds of decisions and in terms of uh, of timing um, the, the one comment I guess I'd have is um, a lot of those really early phase models you do have to make a lot of assumptions around right you, you don't know what the specific design parameters are so a number of those assumptions um, would be potentially embodied in your system level project goals. Um, so those could be utilized as some of your initial assumptions. Obviously in the early phase modeling, you don't have a design even maybe, so you're, you're uh, auto sizing everything. You're using defaults in the model. You're um, doing it uh, quickly. The important thing to understand about early phase modeling is at that point you're you're trying to make obviously as accurate a prediction of the future energy use as you can but because there's so many assumptions and so forth associated with those early phase models um, what's more important in many ways is the relative difference between the different modeling iterations that you do so if, if you do an iteration and it shows that 10 percent savings that 10 percent is a good solid number the absolute number of BTUs may not be an entirely accurate prediction because of all the assumptions but those relative differences will hold pretty well um, you can also do this early phase modeling in a, a, with a lot of different software I can do a box model in um, less than a half, half an hour uh, for almost every project um, so some of these things don't require very much modeling time at all in order to develop a model that's useful for helping to guide decision making. And this is this is Eric here. One one thing I would add about this idea of, of not being able to get the information in a timely fashion, people who are energy modelers often, you know, struggle with getting information from the design team or the owner. Um, that was a topic of a lot of discussion in the development of the standard, and there are there's some language in there. Uh, because this was largely written by energy modelers, there's some language in there that talks about the roles of each of the team members and says that, you know, the other designers shall um, provide information and shall participate in this process. Now, off, 
obviously if it just says that in the standard, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. But it it if an owner or jurisdiction adopts a standard, then it gives people something to point to and say, hey, you know, we all play a role here and um, your role is important in providing information and, and buying off on input assumptions and all that. So that's, you know, maybe the standard will help push that a little bit further. And we, we are at seven. I'm certainly willing to stick around. I don't know if we're supposed to, though. Um, well, we do have a few more questions. Um, perhaps uh, maybe Marcus or, or Jason, you want to make any final parting comments, but then we could stick around for a few more minutes if people want to and deal with those other questions. Um, well, you could certainly show this uh, slide if you'd like. Yeah. But, um, I, mostly, I think we should should deal with the questions that might be uh, still out there. So. Sure, that's that's fine with me. Okay. Um, there's just a few more. Uh, Pablo asks, any horizon for international applications? I'm, I'm trying to think why this wouldn't play on international projects. It seems yeah. to me it would. Uh, would be pretty universally applicable in that regard. Yeah, I, I think it was written with the expectation that it could be used uh, anywhere, any, anywhere that uh, energy modeling is used. Okay. Uh, Shubra asks, um, as long as the sizing software is able to give an 8760 hour output, would it be acceptable for this standard? I think the standard is only going to look at <clears throat> kind of like what modeling software might be acceptable, and I think if it if it does so at all, I'm trying to remember, it would probably defer to Appendix G to define acceptable modeling software, which I think references ASHRAE 140, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's how we would define it. Yeah. Okay. Basically, if it's acceptable to Appendix G, it's it's good enough right. for this standard. Good. Okay. Um, and then Daniel writes, uh, with regards to the energy modeler qualifications, the uh, BEMP, BISA, and other, is the other method providing a way out of having an accredited building energy modeling professional either complete or review the energy modeling? Well, uh, the current requirements, I are uh, basically to, to either be uh, BEMP certified, BISA certified, or the, the language is an individual meeting qualifications established by the authority having jurisdiction. So that third uh, was allowed for, let's say, um, a utility program that might have their own requirements for simulation uh, requirements. So we don't want to exclude people from uh, that type of scenario, so that's why we included that third option. Okay. Uh, Shubra asks, um, the successful implementation of the standard would be established by comparing to the EUI target? So, uh, I, th I think in my opinion, the successful implementation of the standard on a pro project would result in a more a project that's more energy efficient. Um, so, you know, targets can be established uh, with very kind of low aspirations and can be established with much higher aspirations. So whether you hit your target or not, I'm not sure is going to tell you the successful implementation of it. I think did the modeling cycles that you performed during design add value to the project? Did it result in um, you know greater energy savings, did it result in a reduced first cost? Did it result in uh, maybe some you know utility money coming in to help uh, pay for different strategies? Right, those are the kind of um, metrics that I would personally utilize in terms of uh, whether it was successful or not. Yeah, and and the uh, committee debated the topic of whether there should be some kind of requirement for reducing EUI or so, something like that, and and ultimately we decided we we weren't trying to reproduce 90.1. Uh, that sets minimum energy requirements for buildings, 
Uh, instead, we were providing a methodology for applying um, simulation to aid the design process. So that's really where we're focusing. Okay, um, maybe the two more questions. Uh, so Derek asks, or he notes, um, in several design cycles, there isn't a reporting section. Uh, this does not help define deliverables. Is this something to address? For example, cycles number four and number five, there's no specific reporting section. Well, I think that you need to look back on the general modeling cycle requirements. Uh, that's section 5.7, and you'll see that um, reporting is a requirement there, um, and that applies to all the modeling cycles. So there is reporting required for all the modeling cycles. And yeah, I think if I remember correctly, there was some additional reporting required for a couple of the cycles. That's why reporting might be mentioned in that cycle, but there is kind of a generic set of uh, information that needs to be reported for every modeling cycle. Okay, uh, and the last one of the online questions that I see here are is from Amir, and it asks, what mandatory qualifications for the energy modelers are being considered? Well, I think we went over that a little bit already. Um, there's these modeling credential requirements, but um, uh, so basically you have to be either BEMP or BISA or some other qualifications established by the authority that's adopted the standard. And maybe to follow up on that, Jason, would the would that person have to be doing all the work? Um, you know, the energy modeler who creates the energy model, would that person need to be certified? Yeah, I believe that we required the, the modeler who's taking responsibility for the modeling to uh, be certified. I, although I believe that other people can aid in the modeling process, uh, but ultimately the person who's the modeler uh, needs to have those credentials. Right, okay. Yeah, the, the way I look at it, I think it's like akin to somebody stamping the drawings. Like there are people that aren't stamping the drawings that are working on the drawings. But uh, you know there is there is somebody that's responsible, and they need to have that credential. All right. Well, those are the that's the last of the um, online questions. Uh, if anybody has any final questions, please type that in quickly. Otherwise, um, I think that's it. Do you want to wrap it up, Jason or Marcus? I just want to thank everybody for coming and uh, uh, think good thoughts for uh, Cheryl and hopefully she uh, didn't break anything. Yeah, and I guess uh, one last one last reminder that uh, uh, May 9th is the deadline here and that's really not that far away. So uh, uh, please, uh, if you're going to help us out, uh, please do it soon. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your help, Eric.